Hi, and thank you guys for tuning in. We'll be live with Aurelia Dominic shortly. We hope that you stay tuned in, share with your friends, and we will talk to you soon. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to the Latino Pittsburgh Digital Speaker Series. Today, we're here with Aurelia Dominic. She is the Chief Medical Officer of Organization at Highmark. Hi, thank you for joining us. <laughs> we'll unmute her so she can chime in. How are you today? I'm doing well, thank you. And again, I am Aurelia Dominic, and I am a medical research policy analyst at Highmark, and I'm also a behavioral scientist by training. And today I'd like to share a little bit of my life story and share with you as a private citizen in terms of how do we survive during a pandemic and post pandemic uh, to be successful in the space that we uh, contribute to, and more importantly, being a Latina. Aurelia, thank you for joining us. So it was so fascinating talking to you in our pre-interview. I learned so much about you, the pandemic, everything. So I just want to jump right in so that everyone else can learn as well. Um, I want to start with your life story and a little bit about what made you who you are today. So where did you grow up? Oh, I think so. I was born and raised in San Antonio, Texas, and I was uh, raised just in the traditional um, Latino Hispanic uh, family with the culture, the traditions, the uh, value system that was in place. And I think all of that combined allowed me opportunities to advance and to make a contribution, both for um, myself and my own interest, as well as to um, the individuals that I have the privilege of working with and in the communities that we live. So tell us a little bit. I know that your family life is very interesting to me. Um, so <laughs> tell, tell us a little bit about your immediate family. Okay, certainly. Um, I grew up in the traditional uh, Latina family. It was very large. I am the youngest of a very large family. And all of us were instilled in us at a very young age to value education, to have a faith-based system that can be our moral compass, and also to be the best that you can, to be freed in the perspective from the sky's the limit. And I think with that type of encouragement and that upbringing, we were able to advance and set goals and try to do our best to reach them. I was very fortunate to have a large family that provided support, all types of social support. And I also had an extended family and that was our neighbors, our nieces, nephews, aunts, uncle, cousins, as well as our the friends that we um, had within the neighborhood. And even the community leaders that taught us that in, in society, we are not alone and that we are able to uh, help each other and set common goals and work together to meet those goals. So I did grow up in a very large family. I also had, um, I guess, challenges in life like everyone else did. Uh, we had everything under the sun 
And the good thing is that if you're standing solid as to who you are and what you are aiming to accomplish in life, and if you know the why, why do you do what you do? Why do you want to make a difference? Why do you want to open a business? Why do you want to lead? Why do you do the things that you do? If you know your why, you're able to move um, forward and allow any stumbling block to become a stepping stone. And I think that's also part of my upbringing that if they give you a lemon or you have a lemon, you make a lemonade. If it's a stumbling block that you make it into a stepping stone and that you invest the hard work that's needed to succeed, that you use strategies that are taking you one step closer to your goal as opposed to letting it uh, sidetrack you and, and give up like many Latinos uh, tend to uh, to do in, in time of despair. And I think the last um, component as to how did we get to where we are now is that you always overcome objection. I think every single Latino, rather you're trying to open a business or you're trying to expand or increase the capacity of your service area, um, I think sometimes we're always told you can't do that. That's never been done before. I have reason to believe that that may not be possible. In other words, every no, we all get no's. Um, I think that as Latinos, we are resilient and we are innovative and we like to do first evers. And I think that's also one of the signature and the strong track record that we have of, of doing first evers. And so the upbringing shapes who you are and it also guides you in the steps to take to reach your goals. And many of these things you become first ever at aiming to do what you need to do. So uh, as you were talking, I think your camera got moved a little bit. If you just want to slide it over so you're in the middle, we want to see your beautiful face very well. Thank you. Yeah, a little bit higher. <laughs> it happens. Um, so <laughs> growing up, I was so surprised to hear that you were one of how many? <laughs> it takes a dozen and a half. I'm the youngest of 16, but it is a blended marriage. And my father was widowed with five children. His first wife died giving birth to the fifth child. Met my mother. They obviously fell in love, had children, sets of twins, and combined, we're 16. So I am the youngest of 16. And I think it also speaks to perseverance, and it, it speaks also to um, allowing society to set parameters but they don't define you and they don't allow uh, the limitations to keep you from reaching your goal, regardless if you're just the only child in your family or you are the youngest of many. <laughs> that is amazing. That that seems like a lot. But yeah, I guess that's like a, a typical Latino family. Tell us a little bit about how culture and where your parents are from and how that culture influenced your life growing up. Oh, the culture um, and the cultural roots are very deep in my family. I think like many of our listeners, uh, we value the family. We value good food and we value fellowship. In terms of what does all that mean, it also means that you have an identity and you have a rich heritage and that heritage can continue to reap the benefit of having such a rich culture. For example, you might uh, be preparing dinner someday and that recipe you're using is one that was passed down from generation to generation. So that is one of the values that I see in terms of my own personal journey as to what does it mean to have a cultural a root, a cultural identity, and to be able to anchor yourself to so that you know who you are, where you come from, and uh, where you're headed. In terms of the second question, I think you said, where were my family uh, from my parents' perspective? Um, my parents were very hard workers and they instilled in their children, again, the fundamental principles of you love your family, you love your neighbor, you love your country, and more importantly, you love what you represent and what is so unique to our culture. And as long as you're not ashamed of being a Latino, I think you could always, always build on the rich culture that is found within the Latino uh, heritage. And how do you define that culture? What do you think are the key points that make Latino culture unique? I think number one, we've contributed a lot to many industries. Uh, for example, if you love tomatoes, you can thank the uh, the Mexicans, the, uh, the, La the Latinos who brought that uh, culinary staple into every home. If you also love chocolate, again, thank, thank a Hispanic. 
If you love corn, thank a Hispanic. If you love television and, and having the ability to see television in color, thank a Hispanic. It, there were just so many interventions and innovative contributions that Hispanics have made. And we recognize them during Hispanic Heritage Month, which is October 15th or September 15th to October 15th. But there's every, in every single industry, there is influence and contributions from Hispanics. And that allows us to stand tall and to also recognize that those contributions make our life better. And from one capacity or another, rather it be in health, there's a lot of contributions in the medical devices, the therapeutic procedures, even in women's health, men's health. Uh, for industry, everything uh, from contributions to automobile uh, industry to even housing uh, industry. I know that my father grew up a lot in construction and building custom homes. And so in every single industry, there's always the the fingerprints of Latinos where they have improved a process or they've improved a, a service uh, uh, a service that's being provided um, either to our own community or um, our state or even even a global contribution. So I think that um, the personal journey to get you where you are, you are pretty ahead of the curve if you come from a very rich cultural background. And I think that's what Latinos bring to the table. And so why do you think that it's important for those people who aren't in the Hispanic community, who don't associate with the Hispanic community and are just coming in and realizing, oh my gosh, there are Latinos here in Pittsburgh. What is the value of getting to know the Latino culture and how can that have a positive impact on their life? Okay, well, that's a very, very, very good question. And I think it's one that becomes uh, increasingly important to understand the presence of Latinos. Um, first of all, we have to go back and understand that in the United States, the demographic profile is changing. And we see that there are various groups. And if you compare that over time, some groups remain steady over time. So for example, African-Americans in the year 2000, we had about, oh, I would say 12% uh, of the group that identified as African-American. If you fast forward in time to 2050, that uh, African-American group continues to remain at 12 or 13%. If you fast forward 100 years to 20 or uh, 2001 or 2100, how do you say 2020? 2020 is easy. So it's 2100 or 2100, whatever. 100 years probably. 2100 or 2100, uh, yeah, near 2100. Um, basically, the African American community remains at 13%. So that remains unchanged over time. If you look at the Asian Indian Pacific Islander, it starts at, uh, goodness, uh, I believe it's um, probably at 3%, 4%, and then it increases um, 100 to the 2100 mark. Uh, it increases to about uh, 13%. That uh, particular group, Asian Indian Pacific Islanders, is growing exponentially and a lot faster uh, than the Hispanic group in such a short time. In the Hispanic group, it starts off, I believe it's closer to maybe 8% in 2000. And then by the time it comes to uh, uh, 2100, then it becomes what we call um, one third, one third of the population, which increases to 33%. The white Caucasian non-minority group is the one that decreases. And it decreases from almost uh, three fourths of the pie all the way down to probably a um, little less than half. So what does all this mean? That means that it doesn't matter if it's just a Latino group that the social demographic profile is changing. What it all means is that we have a diverse um, state and we have a diverse nation. And that diversity re represents that everyone brings commonality to the table Everyone eats, everyone uh, wakes up in the morning, um, everyone needs the fundamental uh, basic needs, right, from food, shelter, and so forth. But if you really want to bring in the cultural component, you will be able to experience music and cuisine prepared a little different than other, than other uh, cultures. And it's those differences that make us richer, and it also makes us um, enjoy I guess what we could call the diversity that's found in our state. In mm -hmm. Pennsylvania, we have 12.8 million individuals. 
we started tracking in some of our studies when I was at Penn State uh, College of Medicine, we wanted to address Latino health and we wanted to emphasize on how do we improve um, screenings for certain cancers uh, among Latinos. One in particular was colorectal cancer. And first we had to find out well, where are Latinos? Where are they living in the 67 counties? We quickly realized that in some counties, uh, we started, well, first the data, these data didn't exist. And as a Latino, when you don't have something, then you try to invent it or you try to create it. If there's not the model you need, then you try to create it. If you need to improve something and finding the demographic information and the cancer incidence and mortality rate for Latinos was very difficult. In fact, it was lacking. And when I was trying to have a baseline as to how can I compare what I want to improve to where we've started, that starting point known as a baseline was lacking. And I think many listeners always find a project, they want to compare it to something so they can demonstrate it improved, it had a, a return on investment and so forth. But if they can't find the baseline, um, it becomes more difficult. So one of the challenges was if it doesn't exist, then you create it. So we end ended up tracking the settlement patterns for Latinos to figure out where are they living. And I'll share with you offline um, a slide deck that we have that shows that uh, it is increasing over time. We started at 200,000 back in 1995, and now we're about the million mark. And we tracked those by county. And it also um, showed that some of these counties in the 67 counties, that some counties have experienced population growth for Latinos seven times higher than the state estimate. So there are some counties exactly. that have a lot more. Um, traditionally, so why, do you think that, why do you think that there's that big disconnect? Um, the big disconnect in terms of why all counties do not have the same growth uh, rate is because uh, Latinos tend to gravitate to communities that are economic generators. And there are some counties that have economic generators that um, are in the industries that uh, some Latinos tend to be real skilled at. One is the um, farming and one is also in the meatpacking industry. And so, for example, there's Juniata County um, towards uh, Central PA. There's different counties that have um, different job uh, uh, opportunities. And so in those counties is where you'll find a higher um, population growth. What does all that mean for Pennsylvania or for anyone in the, in the, in the state? It basically means that they're your customers. They are the ones that if you are in business, you have a product to sell and someone needs to buy it. And if you know who your customer is, you're able to tailor it to the wants and the needs of that customer. And Latinos rather be the customer in a clinic where the doctor, the, uh, the customer is the patient, or rather be a, um, a lumber company or a car dealership or um, housing, if whatever the business is, if you, able, if you are able to understand Latino culture, if you're able to understand their wants and their needs, and more importantly, their value system, that helps incre increase what they call the relationship building. And that is a happy customer spends money, a happy customer buys things. And you want your customers to be uh, buying things, you want them to support your businesses, and more importantly, you want to have customer satisfaction. And so that is why it's important to know not just Latinos, but know your customers. And as you know your customers, you're able to, to um, better meet their needs and improving that experience. You have so many vast experiences. One thing that always amazes me about you is you, well, first of all, my computer falling. <laughs> um, I don't know what's up with it today. Um, no, but you have just this vast amount of knowledge in so many areas. And I really think that that starts with how you were raised. So you told me a little bit about how um, your parents were a little bit entrepreneurial. And we had talked about um, specifically the role of women and mothers in the Hispanic community. Um, why don't you share a little bit about what the dynamic was like at home and what your parents did for a living? Okay, certainly. The dynamics at home, um, I think, were traditional, just like everyone else's home. The only difference is that there's advice that's given to us, to each and every one of us. And some of that advice is awesome. And it reminds you that the sky's the limit and you can do anything that you want and accomplish whatever your goal is. And then there's another advice that I don't know how it creeps into our life, 
but it reminds you of everything you cannot do. And it reminds you of the no's. And it reminds you that um, you might not be able to do everything. And the environment that I was grown up with is that, trust me, it is very difficult. You will have to work hard. But if you are passionate about what you do, it's great. But you have to be darn good at what you do. And in order to be extremely good at what you do, you have to receive proper training, proper experiences. And you have to always remember that it is not all about you, that it is about the people you serve. It is about the community you live in. And it's also about a team. And I think those were all the key ingredients that allowed me to turn every stumbling block into a stepping stone. And they also put together, my parents, they were very adamant about an education. They said, there's one thing that you can never lose, and that's your education, unless you forfeit it. If you decide to quit, if you decide not to cross the stage, just because someone says you can't, you don't have what it takes to go to college, you don't have what it takes to, to own your business, you don't have what it takes. My father says, and my, my mother would always say, listen to that advice, ask and probe, okay, how can I improve? If I don't have something, could I acquire it? Could I somehow improve myself? And I think that is part of the, the blueprint that is in me, that you're right. When you're little, if someone says you can't, the first thing that comes to my mind is, what will it take for me to do that? And then invest the time for you to be successful. And not, not just passionate, though. everyone I think wants to save the world. I think everybody wants to have something to do. But we often are reminded that it's hard work, it's perseverance that's required. Mm -hmm. It, you need to be resilient and not everything is easy in life. And so as long as you remain constant and move forward, you're able to, um, to get closer to that goal. In terms of who my parents were, again, they were very hard workers and um, they contributed to various industries. In terms of women, um, my mother did work from home or uh, was a, um, a stay home mom, if you will, to raise us. But she was also an entrepreneur within herself, uh, within in her own self, right? Uh, we learned a lot from her. And uh, both of them died when I was a very young age. And I think um, that's also just to remind the uh, audience that sometimes you want to grow up and say, when I grow up, I'm going to buy this and that for my parents, or I'm going to get them that car, or I'm going to get them that uh, ice maker, whatever it is that you want to one day buy your loved ones. But if they die before you're able to reach your goals, um, your whole life needs to continue. And that was um, one of the things my parents and growing up that they that they shared with me, and um, they lived it by example. They also had it in their worth ethic. But that value in education um, is one that, um, I think that is one of the biggest uh, uh, block that I stand on the shoulders of, if you will. So um, for Latinos, education, higher education is a hurdle. As you know, Latinos are the least likely to complete higher education. Um, and for all of the great things that we're doing, all the numbers that are growing, you know, we're opening the most businesses. There's so many firsts that you have done. Why do you think that there is that disconnect? I think it's a disconnect uh, based uh, based on the mentorship that's lacking and the real life examples that Latinos need. I think really any culture would need. If you want to become uh, X, Y, and Z, okay, to get there, uh, it requires mentorship. No man is an island. And when it comes to Latinos, because they have such a advanced, oh, how do we say this? Added, um, they just there's. Latinos, when they start young, they learn about money. They learn about babysitting. They learn about responsibilities. They learn how to care for their neighbors and care for themselves. They also become a trusted source. And those skills are learned very, very early on. But when it comes to say, I want to go to college, I want to graduate, the first thing that they are reminded is always oh, difficult. It's very, very hard. Very few do it. And it sort of brings in this negativity and this, this uh, they're just discouraged. And you need a balance. You need a balance of reality that it is hard. But there are strategies we can put in place to help you get there. If it's extra tutoring, so be it. We go to extra tutoring. If it's extra mentorship, so it is. 
but you have to have someone reach out. And that was one thing that helped me. My parents really embraced me with support, social support or family support, but they also put an, a social support around me of professionals that say, hey, my daughter may want to become a doctor. So I would be introduced to doctors that maybe I could shadow in their clinic. Back then we could shadow. Now I don't know if they allow shattering. Uh, I think it's called more internships once they're in the program. But that is a big disconnect as to the Latinos start strong, 100% start kindergarten. And by the time we get 12 years later, we have in some districts just 30% crossing the stage, 70% fall out. What is the difference? What is the difference between a Latino that starts kindergarten and has 100% attendance to the issues that allow them to, oh my goodness, they didn't pass because of truancy, because of excessive absences, because of the grade, something happened along the way. And one thing that we do know for sure is Latinos are smart, they're resilient. And no matter how many times they are told no, Okay. They must hear in their lifetime a yes, you can do this. And this is what it would take. And here's the social support and the mentoring in place that's needed. The second is financial assistance. Uh, education is hard. I believe if you ask any Latino at any given time, they have held at least two jobs in their lifetime. For those that have got paid, maybe it was the one after the age of 18 where they were able to work somewhere, but everything else is like, you, you just help out because that's the right thing to do. But everyone has had at least two jobs, even when they're in high school, even when they're in college. But what happens is um, there are so many programs for Latinos to open their businesses. There's programs to go to school. There are programs to uh, that would help pay for their student loans, that would even help for their training, especially in areas that are underrepresented uh, by Latinos. And those programs say, hey, we have the money. We just don't have the candidates. You know, we have scholarships. I know that the, the chamber here also supports uh, entrepreneurs and opportunities and scholarships. And I encourage every listener to number one, if someone said you cannot do it, I am here to encourage you and remind you that yes, you can do it if that is the pathway, but you must find out number one, is that the pathway that's the best pathway? Because there's many pathways, maybe not that one, it could be another one. And the second is find yourself a mentor. Find yourself a mentor. It doesn't mean it's someone you know, but it's someone who you want to be like. If you want to be a president of a bank, if you want to have a franchise, whatever your business is, I would ask you to see, okay, who would be your number one competitor? If that is the dynamics it took for that company to get to that level, then you may want to reach out to experts to see how can I too become at that level. So mentoring is very important. Um, having your answer to why do you want to do this is very important. To apply for programs that are there specifically designed for underserved populations, which Latinos are in some industries, start applying. If you do not apply, it automatically eliminates you from the equation to be considered. And so what is the disconnect? The disconnect is multifactorial. Many factors come to play, but there's one thing that remains consistent, and that is you. They'll never be, for example, another Mel Melly one you. You have your skill set. We all have weaknesses and we all have strengths. And we have to learn to use our strengths and we have to learn how to find opportunities to improve our weaknesses. But we most important, we have to have a social support system in place that could help us understand the, the tools of the trade, if you will, or what is the company's culture or what is the, the, uh, the toolbox full of the tools that you would need so you can be successful in what you do. Another another uh, gap is reading and writing, the math skills, the technology skills, and the written skills. Uh, those are areas that we could always improve on, me included. And there are also areas that we now have so much technology that you can take videos and whatnot on YouTube at no cost from professors that are putting um, these types of lectures online. What you have today is much different than what I had when I was growing up. And I love, really I love that there are so many opportunities for non-traditional education. And I love how you said, um, you know, 
there are so many different pathways and there isn't one pathway that's right. You know, we all reach our destination in a different way, um, but as long as we get there, that's really what matters. Um, and I was thinking a little bit about, you know, we talked about what you wanted to be when you grew up. I know you said you wanted to be a doctor um, and now, you know, you're in public and community health. I would love for you to share with us what you went to school for and what that journey looked like, mostly for the students who will watch this later, who see all of the amazing things you're doing and want to emulate that. Okay, certainly. So again, I, I fell in love with uh, medicine. I fell in love with uh, public health. And I started in the pathway as biology as a major and pre-med. I quickly learned that many of the models that were being used in a clinical setting could be improved, um, especially among uh, cultural and diverse um, members or, or what we call patients. And I wasn't the doctor. I was just the intern or I was just the one that was um, shadowing. And my voice really didn't matter because what we have in the clinic are guidelines that doctors follow. We have certain uh, prescriptions, for example, that are prescribed to patients based on the condition. And it automatically tells you how many to give per day, take two by mouth or um, take this for 10 days or if it's a Z pack, whatever. Uh, maybe it could be in a take two, take three or take three, take two, take one. Five. But the point is this. When you go to um, become a physician, you're there to fix what is broken. And to break it, there are guidelines as to what protocols are the best things to use. That is, was very, um, oh, I guess I should say, it was very attractive for me to, to be in that position. But the more I spent time shadowing it, I decided that I didn't want to be just a, um, a doctor that saw a patient, one patient at a time or a clinic, that I basically wanted every single doctor who is ha who has a touch point with a patient to provide them the best protocol, the best uh, option so that the patient can survive and the patient can have a better health outcome. And I quickly learned from my mentors that um, they, they really encouraged me to say, if you really want to shape the guidelines, if you really want to improve the public health, then doing it one patient at a time is great. But maybe going into a public health perspective is better. So I switched then from pre-med and I went straight into trying to prevent chronic diseases in populations. I wasn't just interested in one Latino, I wanted all Latinos. I wasn't interested just in one, one county or one city, I wanted all, all of the state. And then I wanted the entire nation. And now I'm at the point where I'm so greedy that now I want the whole world. <laughs> so I want global health too. <laughs> like, uh, that's not greedy. I think yeah. that's very selfless. <laughs> but, um, and I have to go back, as you mentioned, you know, my family um, grew up. You don't love anyone more than your own mother and your own parents or your own parents. And I had a stumbling block where both died at a, at a very young age when I was at a very young age. And so you have to go forth. Why do you want to do what you do? And why did I want to go into public health or go into um, medicine or into biobehavioral health? And that is basically my mother died prematurely of type 2 diabetes. When she had it, we did not have the advances in medicine that we have today where it could be prevented 91% of the time with diet and exercise and, and things you can do. Back then, we were told it was all genes and there's really nothing you can do. So my why was that no one else loses their mother, that no one else in their family suffers um, for the loss of their, their sister. Their, in my case, it was my mother, but there's a lot of individuals um, who lose their loved ones to uh, prematurely to diabetes. And so that was my why, because one diabetes death was one too many, and it is, still is one too many. I started studying everything about diabetes, and then that led me to, I need to do more than just to know the anatomy. And so that led me to another program that looked at nutrition. So that led me to my master's in nutrition, my bachelor's in biology, all about biology. Then I wanted to know more about how does um, physical activity and nutrition play a role in diseases that you can prevent. Um, and then I ended up getting a master's in nutrition. I then wanted to go beyond that and wanted to learn, okay, if people um, know that's knowledge and awareness, I want to increase, right? So then I went into this whole training of how do you increase knowledge? How do people learn? 
Mm-hmm. How do they make their choices? How do they um, balance life when they have a prescription that is $300 a month and they have a car payment that's $300 a month or they have a light bill that's $300 or a house bill that's $300? Which one do you pay? And it just seemed like all the research I was working with and working on, individuals always prioritize the light, cutting of the light or having food on the table more so than by getting the prescription and or putting their health first. With that perspective, I started uh, was very intrigued as to how people learn and how do they make these choices. So then I received another um, master's, um, and that was in biobehavioral health. And in biobehavioral health, it tells you everything about the biology, but it also tells you about the behavior and how you can have the best health outcome. I then decided that um, I would go straight to prevent diseases and uh, learn that anyone that has diabetes is at risk and increased risk for having a second condition that's known as a comorbid condition. And so we saw started to see people and patients um, in the clinics and in the community having to deal with diabetes and hypertension or diabetes and cardiovascular disease or diabetes and obesity or diabetes and high cholesterol. Um, and then it came into um, my work where we quickly saw that Um, individuals that have diabetes were at increased risk of getting certain cancers, colorectal cancer, uh, liver cancer, um, other um, uh, cancers as well. So I started to learn everything and and receive training and funding to study what is it that affects Latinos and health. That's, That's the group I focused in. And then I changed it to expand it to include medically underserved populations. And it started with diabetes and then it went with diabetes and cancer and then all the other comorbidities that we looked at. And one thing that I've learned throughout my entire training is access to care. And so um, in my po- in my studies here in Pennsylvania, where we try to increase colorectal cancer among Latinos, these were some of the first ever studies that were conducted that I led. And through those experiences, I learned that access to care was important and that over 60% of the population did not have insurance or were uninsured. I then tried to understand why are they uninsured if indeed they're employed, they work two or more jobs. And I learned that they were working in part-time status, which makes them ineligible to become with full benefits to have healthcare insurance and so forth. And then I also learned the importance to integrate the healthcare delivery system so that if a person gets a uh, positive uh, reading for a test, they now have to go for further diagnostic testing. And sometimes that testing had to go to a different facility. Um, and sometimes it had an added cost as well. And so we had to coordinate the healthcare system with the Cancer Institute with indeed taking on individuals as new patients, even individuals that were seen at a federally qualified center, uh, which many individuals are familiar with, but basically you just have this ability to pay in the federally qualified centers, which is a little different than the other um, healthcare system. But that integrated delivery care system and uh, health services research is what then started to intrigue me because I knew that had a component. Um, so again, I went straight to formal training. And that's, that's uh, I think what I'm trying to say is start your journey. Anyone that wants to finish their education, please start it and finish it, but don't let it be your final destination. Because there are so many advances in medicine that we all need training. And this training has to be constant. And it's okay to go back to school to learn either the first time or to expand what you already know. And it was my journey and my attitude that these are people's lives. It's one that I want to improve. And I have to take the responsibility to be as knowledgeable and as current as I can so I can be accurate. I could be timely. I could be impactful. And more importantly, I'm able to let the science lead and use the strategies that uh, we've known to work in the past, but also be open to the new strategies that innovation uh, brings our way. Um, I then looked at, uh, went from the individual level, I went to the state and populations. And part of that population um, then also led me to have postdocs. Uh, postdocs, one in health services research for the healthcare delivery systems. And then the other postdoc that I did was epidemiology. And that was really the disease surveillance. What is it doing? Uh, Today, we apply all those knowledges to COVID-19 
and what it's doing to Latinos and um, I guess we could say cultural and racial minorities and the communities. We know that they are having it more difficult both to protect themselves from getting COVID and spreading it during the pandemic. And many of these reasons are attributed right back to what they call social determinants of health. So that is a very long way to say, how did I get to where I'm at? I think 10 years ago, 20 years ago, I would say, I don't know, I just want to help people and go in that direction. Looking back in time is you have to let science lead you. And you have, if, you, if indeed that is exactly what uh, your space is. In your case, it might be confectionery um, or it might be the, the housing industry or the automobile industry or the or housing and development and legal and whatnot. But whatever area that drives you, you have to keep up with it and you have to now integrate technology. So I never stopped learning. One of my mentors said, never stop learning. My other mentor had said, be passionate about what you do, but be damn good at what you do. And to be very, very good, it requires training and it also experience and practice. And another um, um, great saying that uh, I follow is one that says a prepared mind is important and chance favors a prepared mind. So things happen sometimes, you can't explain it, but I certainly know that if you are very well prepared to give an answer for what you do and how you do it, you will have a better outcome and, uh, as opposed to just drawing things from the air and uh, having this saying that says, follow your nose, it always knows. In my case, the direction changed every time I turned my head, you know, like follow your nose, that was this way, go that way, no, go this way. But um, learning is good. And I, li I like to encourage every listener to please never stop learning. And number two, never give up. And it is okay to learn multiple things across multiple areas because somehow it all intersects. And that intersection is the one that allows you to, to be resilient and to better understand your industry or your space. And it really does allow you to have a greater impact if you understand what dynamics are in place which social determinants of health, which are the circumstances of where people live and where they work and where they worship and where they play, where they grow. In other words, the neighborhoods, the amount of money, the opportunities are all related. And the more you know um, your customer, the better you are to offer the products that they need and the greater customer satisfaction you can achieve. And that's true whether it's a patient or if it is uh, any other product that you may be offering to your to your customer and never give up. I love how everything kind of goes through for you. Like I can kind of see how we talked earlier a little bit about your childhood and your views on things and how that started with, I don't wanna just help one person, I wanna help everyone. And in everything you say, like you just said, you know, when you look at a customer, you apply that to all of the different ways that someone can be a customer. You know, you're always looking to make sure that it applies to everyone. And that is one thing I think is so beautiful about the way that you approach everything is just to help people and make the world a better place. So we definitely appreciate that. I wanna hear about how COVID-19 changed what you do and how you took that perspective of, here's a problem, I wanna help everyone. Tell us about that. Um, sounds good. So I started again with diabetes and his comorbidities, right? Then I had an opportunity to join um, Highmark in health equity and trying to close disparity gaps. And that took me really to the entire HEDIS measures, which are um, at any given year over 79 different measures that address um, the conditions that uh, happen within a clinical setting. Um, and I had to quickly learn everything from well child uh, wellness. I had to learn about vaccines. I had to learn um, really everything that a patient may go into in, into a doctor's office. It expanded. It expanded my my um, my expertise, if you will, in just chronic diseases. And when COVID came again, COVID is not diabetes. COVID is a virus. COVID is a, an infection that's highly contagious. And we know that through science, what we know today is that it is highly contagious. It is face-to-face -face contact where it, trans, um, it transmits. And we know that in order for COVID-19 
um, for it to do damage, it has to enter the body. And we know that it enters the bodies through the eyes, the nose, and the mouth predominantly. And we know that the mitigation efforts and the communications that are coming from the Center for Disease Control, from our Secretary of Health here in the local health department in Pennsylvania, and really throughout the nation and probably globally as well, is that number one, you avoid touching your eyes, your nose, and your mouth, and that you wash your hands frequently. Well, you and I both know that we touch our face frequently. You know, we got to adjust our hair and we have to do everything, right? In fact, there were some, some studies that say that the average American would touch their face over 37 times an hour. And if you multiply that by... Uh, it. Okay, that's over 300 times. So we oh wash our hands, right? And they always say, well, before you eat, uh, right before you or after you go to the bathroom, um, when your hands are dirty, wash them. But with, an, with a uh, COVID-19, that protocol uh, became more important because in mm -hmm. order for the virus to enter the body, it has to enter it through the eyes, the nose, and the mouth. So uh, washing the hands became important. And that was also part of my training at uh, NIH and others where we talked about infectious diseases, uh, mm -hmm. chronic diseases. So we knew the importance of washing our hands. I think all of you know, those of you that are Latinos, you know your grandmother, your mother, lavate la manos. Everybody has to wash their hands at all times, right? So it's not rocket science, right? It's not anything under the new, uh, under the sun that's new. We all wash our hands. But thinking back of this COVID-19, it made me think of my father. My father was born in 1917, and they've been comparing the um, COVID-19 to the Spanish flu. And the Spanish flu was in 1918. So my father was about six, seven months old. And I thought to myself, my goodness, he survived it. He survived it even when we didn't have these infographics and these 10,000 messages that come at every angle. Wash your hands frequently. Avoid touching your eyes, your nose, and your mouth. If you sneeze, if you cough, use a tissue and dispose of that tissue properly in the trash can or the reciprocal to make sure you disinfect all the common areas, right? The doorknobs, the kitchen counters, your, your cell phone, your keys um, to disinfect and to social distance. Uh, the minimum of, of six feet so that if someone does call, those droplets really don't come uh, too much uh, in contact with you. We also knew that, hey, if you have a fever, if you have, if you're sick, stay home if you're able. I am not too convinced that we had all of this added knowledge as we do today, as we, you know, back in 1917. I do know they wore masks because I came across some pictures. And in, during that pandemic, very similar to the setups we have here in the hospitals, but a lot of individuals, even the physicians and whatnot, did have PP and E, which is a, including the mask. So masks have been here since 1917 and during the Spanish flu pandemic. Uh, today it's mandated if you're out in public, please wear your masks. Um, and so I started thinking to myself, how did my dad survive? And my dad ended up dying of what we call, um, chronic, well, he suffered a lot from chronic bronchitis. And those bronchitis sometimes would turn into pneumonias. And he was strong enough to beat all pneumonias to that point. But the very last chronic, um, um, uh, what do we call it? The last pneumonia, chronic bronchitis that turned into pneumonia, he wasn't able to beat that. He wasn't strong enough. The immune system wasn't as strong. Um, and so he couldn't fight the pneumonia. And uh, he ended up dying of a respiratory failure. But I remember growing up, he would tell us stories of what it was like growing up during his lifetime and the sense of community and the sense of, of you're not alone and people doing the best that they can and to help each other during pandemics. And that immediately prompted me to say, well, what am I doing? Here I am. I, I don't think he ever envisioned that his daughter um, or the youngest of the daughters would uh, be living through a pandemic as well. But I thought to myself, if the community and that sense of community helped my family and my father's family, do I must do something. I, there's something that I must do. And so I started to learn more about COVID-19. I started to see what the patterns were. I used my skills. I used my um, my added skills in surveillance of how is it transmitting, which populations, who's recovering, the severity of the infection versus that which is 
uh, a mild case, for example. And then I quickly learned that underlying conditions, the people with underlying conditions, they were having more difficulty um, during the, this pandemic of COVID-19. And I said, what can I do? What can I do to help? I started working closely with uh, Dr. Eugene Langridge at the Penn State College of Medicine in the Department of Public Health Sciences. He's in epidemiology. He's also a veterinarian by training. And he is also one of the uh, cancer um, uh, directors there. And I said, we need a toolkit. We need to be prepared. We need to have a preparedness plan. We need to have a response plan and one that can be used at home one that can be used in the community, one that can be worked at, used at school and at work. I want to be able to have everyone to have the information that they need so that they can protect themselves from getting COVID and from spreading it. And so I said, can you please show me where to find it so I can share it with others? And he said, it does not exist. And that is not the first time I've been told something that I need does not exist. And so I looked at him and he said, you know what to do. You got to just do it. So that's what I did. I, I uh, did the official um, COVID-19 uh, preparedness toolkit and I co-authored it with him. And we also brought in nine other experts in Pennsylvania, one that could help deal with housing, one that could help deal with financial stability during the pandemic, either the employees that now have to revisit their schedules because the capacity in their restaurants or in their workplace has reduced or was shut down um, or now reopened based on their capacity. Or rather, it'd be someone that was working, a first responder, and somehow they got infected, they got exposed. What do you do then? Um, there were every protocol and every scenario we could think of. We um, sort of simulated and said, okay, what would be needed? And we put that all in the toolkit. We also put there for persons that, for whatever reason, are engaged in risky behaviors, the smoking, the drinking, opioid use, and how to get, where do you get help in the crisis lines when you need it? How do you get uh, treatment and how can you complete treatment? And what are um, access to the medications and, and needed during a pandemic? We also put things in there for oral health. A lot of individuals were unable to see their dentists. And we learned that for Latinos, instead of just repairing the tooth, it had to be extracted. So a lot of young Latinos had to uh, lost their tooth or their teeth during a pandemic. And so we had um, a dentist in there as well to give us how to, how to protect your, uh, your teeth and, and oral health. There was also one for nutrition. A lot of individuals were eating and a lot of people say we all gain weight. Look at me. <laughs> we all gain weight during pandemics, right? But, uh, yeah, but you know what? We're not alone. We're not absolutely alone. not alone. And you can always go back That's down, right. you know, That's changing right. up your habits, especially when you're not in in a pandemic time. I mean, yeah. I know you can give and, some and tips on that And what we learned too. is that um, we are all saying everybody's eating their chips and whatnot, but we're learning there's a lot of individuals that are not eating the high quality of foods and they're becoming anemic. And anemic, one of the symptoms is to be very weak. And so we have uh, energy levels being impacted and we have just nutritional status. So in the toolkit, we also included a whole section as to proper nutrition. Um, we also included another uh, section for applying for assistance some individual needed additional food or how to apply for housing, how to apply for unemployment. There were so many programs, um, even for small businesses, that we knew the applications were there and everybody sort of learned about them, either local news or someone shared a, a website. But we also knew that you needed experts that could answer questions that could help you through the application process. So we have the whole section there, how to apply for assistance. And also... Um, what are some therapies from a faith-based perspective? Latinos are very strong in their faith and a lot of people love music, you know? And so um, a lot of the leaders, we put those together and say, what are some strategies Latinos and others can use? And music therapy was one. And so there's a whole section there of, of how you can get inspirational music or how to let music be a, a form of therapy. Um, gardening is another. So I put together this toolkit um, it gives you information that is real time. It's accurate. It comes straight from the federal and the state level authorities 
on COVID-19, the same ones that do the regulatory arms for recommendations as well as guidelines of CDC in particular and the Department of Health. We also put in there a 1-800 hotline for a crisis. Rather, regardless of what the crisis is, they're all listed there and 24 seven hotlines are there where people can use to call. And Latino said, this is all great. I want to talk to the doctor, that white coat. I don't need anyone to tell me anything. I just want to be able to ask questions. So Penn State was able to team up with us. And Gene, of course, represents the College of Medicine and the Cancer Institute. And he was able to bring that resource to the toolkit. And therefore, anyone can call 24 seven to ask any COVID-19 question to a physician. It's called Penn State On Demand, and it's there. And there's also a social pledge. Many people said the social distancing was something that was more of a curse because they were interpreting it as stay away from me, it's isolation, and guess what? I'm all alone. And so we got again the experts in the different fields to say, how can we get individuals not to feel isolated, that they are not alone? And so there's a social pledge in there that's called social support pledge. I call your trusted local person. There's uh, names that are listed there by county. And then there's a, a space that anyone in Pittsburgh, they could call Melanie. And Melanie, you put your name and the phone number or the email that you'd like. And you give that one pager, standalone pager, and say, this is how we prevent COVID-19. And you're not alone. And here's my number. And I can help you and uh, get you connected to resources. So that toolkit is in English and in Spanish. And it also has... Um, questions of how to apply for assistance, how to ask questions, and more importantly, to ask a doctor. And so that was my contribution. I did not know that it was one of the first that was released here in Pennsylvania. I knew it was for like, be the first for it in Spanish for Latinos, but it, it, it appears to be one of the first uh, that was released from a community-based and an entire holistic perspective. And our first case in Pennsylvania was March the 26th. We immediately started working on this toolkit on March the 26th when the governor declared this as a state of emergency. And bringing everyone together and everyone authoring it, uh, we did it in less than a month as a turnaround time. And so I've given you the, um, the links. It is absolutely free of charge. We made it public domain so that you can share that toolkit with everyone and anyone that you wish and you don't need permission, and you don't have to go to a particular website, although many organizations already posted it on their website. You have it as a PDF form. You also have it as a link and even a bar code that you can scan right on your phone, and you can access it directly. You don't have, you don't, there's no middleman to have access to it, and it is public domain, which means that you can use it in its entirety without any uh, permission. Should you need to extract it and try to change something in there, you just send us an email and we quickly review it. And there hasn't been a request that we have not approved yet. So um, it, that's a long way of saying, why did I respond to the COVID-19? It brought me back to my father who I lost again when I was at a young age. And that was with a respiratory um, condition or disease. And that's exactly what COVID-19 hit. And it just so happens that the Spanish flu of, of uh, 1918 is being compared to COVID of 2020, right? Or COVID-19 since it really came in 19. Um, and that's how I responded. It's just a small step, but I- Just I, a small step. No, no, no. I am not gonna allow you to downplay yourself. She did a massive amount of work in a very short time just for the betterment of the public and to educate the public and keep everybody safe. So not a small step i don't think that anything that you have ever done have you ever taken a small step you take leaps you're such an inspiration to all of us <laughs> um, you're welcome i i want to um i want to talk a little bit about um oh my mind just went blank i can't believe you tried to downplay that so much <laughs> i want to talk a little bit about firsts because you have had so many firsts. And one of the other things I admire about you that I try to apply to my own life is there is no limit. Like possibilities 
are endless. I can do anything as long as I set my mind to it. And that's something I see in you. And as a result, you've been the first at many things. Why don't you share some of those with us? Um, surely. So I'm the first of 16 children. I don't think there's anyone I've met yet that has more than uh, more siblings than 16 here in Pennsylvania. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Okay, so you, you want to know more academic, academic things that we've done. So again, when I was looking at uh, Latino health in Pennsylvania, I had seen the intersection between diabetes and cancer. I, I knew that Latinos were the group that gets least, the, the group that would get the least amount of new cases of cancer for colorectal cancer, but when it came to late stage diagnosis, they were a group that had more late stage diagnosis and those that died prematurely, Latinos were also uh, pretty up there. So you have a group that gets it the least, but they're dying a little bit more of it, right? Um, so I wanted to understand why is that the case because we have a screening tool. For over 40% of all the cancers that we can identify, um, well, actually, 60% of the cancers we can, we have a screening tool for, and 40% of those we can prevent, right? If we caught, if we catch these early enough, uh, when it's easier to treat, we can have uh, increases in survivorship. So I started everything into a better understanding what are barriers to getting colorectal cancer screenings among Latinos, and I designed a, a study that that was funded by the NIH to look at barriers to colorectal cancer screening. We went into uh, different uh, counties, rural versus urban, and mm -hmm. I didn't realize that that was the first ever study in Pennsylvania, but that became one. The second then is we looked, we looked at all of the information that uh, we learned from meeting with Latinos and all the focus groups as to what are barriers, and we also asked what are some solutions or answers to those barriers. Mm -hmm. They gave us a whole, oh, ask a Latino for a, a problem and how to solve it, you will get a wealth of information. And so we looked at it and then we said, I, to me, that sounds reasonable. We've never done this before, but they said it, let's see if it works. So we designed a randomized control trial, um, how to increase um, colorectal cancer screening among Latinos. And they also talked about the importance of social support. And we put in place then also an education piece, social support, um, and then also that healthcare delivery of where to get screened. And using also the modality of screening that gives you convenience to get tested in your own home with a mail-in kit. And again, that was a, a first ever. Um, in terms of my own training, I ended up doing two postdocs at the College of Medicine at Penn State in the mm -hmm. Department public health sciences. One of them was in epidemiology, as I mentioned. The second was in healthcare delivery system and behavioral research. And I was then invited to be a full faculty. And so I became the first Latina to ever be hired in that department. And um, I don't think it was because I am all that. I just think that um, it is at the right time. It is uh, going to uh, limits that uh, go beyond what you uh, have set out to do initially, and uh, you just really don't give up. And so I did become the first uh, Latina there. Another one was um, trying to prevent cancer. I wanted to compare my rates and the models that I was using that was improving uh, colorectal cancer screening. We started at 10% baseline, and our models increased it to 67% to getting screened. So the models do yeah. work, and really, it's really yeah. Them a lot, right? Taking us closer to to where we it's not a hundred percent like we'd like, but sixty seven is definitely better than ten percent. And I didn't have baseline numbers to compare myself. I do have some for the state where everyone's combined, and I work closely with the Department of Health because they do have data reports and they do have cancer plans and they do address the cancers I was looking at, breast cancer as well as colorectal cancers and others. But I didn't have the group for the Latino because. The Latinos, for whatever reason, were underrepresented in the in um, those data that were being looked at, and we had something oh, yes. called NA, non applicable or um, not. It's not available. And so again, I had a conversation with Dr. Langridge, and I said, I need baseline numbers for my Latino group, and we don't have the burden report. And he says it does not exist. And that is again what he says why don't you just create it? And so I created the first ever Latino cancer burden report, but I was very responsible in creating the report to include non-Latinos as well. So that if you look at the burden report, there is all the, or there are um, these data, 
that give you for all all cancer that's ever happened here in Pennsylvania uh, from 1995 all the way to current. And I think that the uh, burden report was released in 2016. So it was everything all the way up to 2016. But I did the entire state and then I did it by county and by age, by sex, by race and ethnicity. And then I also did it by social economic status and all the social determinants of health that we know impact cancer incidence and morbidity and mortality. So in that report, Melanie, if you happen to be non-Latino, you can still see the top 10, the top 20 cancers of new sites. You could also see what is look what it's doing over time. And it could also look at every stage. What I did with those data set is I also extracted the Latino group and I created the same tables, one that says non-Latino and one that says Latino. So you can compare both. That's um, great. So where can people find this information? I will email you the link and um, you could share that. You could also just uh, Google um, Penn State. Oh no, you can just Google Pennsylvania Latino Cancer Burden Report. It's the first one that exists. There hasn't been another one. Um, I do want to update it to give us the most current ones. Now that we're in 2020, I can update it to 2019. But all you have to type in is Pennsylvania Latino Cancer Burden Report, and that's there. What we'll do is after this, we can put some of the links down in the comments. So anyone who's watching or you can circle back. Um, there are so many things that we learned during this. I, I feel like I, I just went to class. It was really amazing. Um, and I want to point out one thing that I really take away every time I listen to you talk is that there is no obstacle too great. There is no goal too great. And not only is it not too great, but you can go far beyond that and just continue to shine and elevate everyone around you. That is always what I get from you. And with that, I want to take one question that we have from the audience before we wrap up. So Richard said, what is the best advice that you could give to people in order to help them prepare for a winter surge of COVID-19 cases? Thank you, Richard. Uh, yeah, that's a very good question, um, Richard. And I think it's also become the million dollar question because all of us know that we have to continue doing what we're doing now. Okay, we still have to continue the social distancing. We still have to continue washing the hands. We still have to follow the uh, CDC guidelines, the Center uh, for Disease Control, as well as the Department of Health. There's there's these the messages that will continue to be just as important during the beginning of a, of a pandemic, during a pandemic, and it'll also continue to be important after the pandemic. So following those uh, basic steps of, again, avoid touching your eyes, your nose, and your mouth, washing your hands frequently, stay home if you're sick, if you're able, disinfect, intensify, um, the cleaning and those frequently touched surfaces. I also would add, and this is just my own interpretation, is that the cleaning should also reflect in your car, in your kitchen, your home. Mm -hmm. um, if you're able to have um, the germ spread, right? And, and, and there's some good germs, right? We always need we always need our immune system to be as strong as it can and to build its antibodies based on exposures, right? We don't need everything to be so sterile and autoclaved. But we certainly do need to improve um, the basic sanitation for respiratory hygiene, for hand washing hygiene, and also for decluttering and uh, just cleaning everything that you come in contact with. We talk about our hands, our nose, and our mouth. We talk about disinfecting doorknobs and uh, countertops. I would ask you also to take one step further and make sure that your home is clean, your car is clean, since you will... Uh, be spending time in that as well. The second thing is to talk to your doctor on a regular basis. Your doctors are very well positioned to tell you how to lower your disease risk and how to get screened based on the guidelines and based on your individual situation. It's called informed decision making. And you need to have these conversations with your doctor. And that happens by visiting and talking with your doctor on a regular basis. Today, there's something that's called telemedicine and um, telehealth. 
that might continue to be the practice that may carry us over during this, uh, I believe you called it a second wave, Richard, I forgot what you called it. But, um, I would like for you to always continue to um, learn about the devices that your uh, and, and capacity that your cell phone has to be able to have these type of virtual uh, telemedicine um, office visits. Some individuals may not want to go to the hospital or to their clinic because they're afraid they might get COVID there. It does not mean you don't see a doctor. We have we have multiple options. And so that's also another strategy that you can use. And the last strategy I'll share with you is you have to have a preparedness plan and you have to have a response plan for yourself, your household, your neighborhood, and in your community. We, um, there are several preparedness plans and response plan, uh, plans. You can go to the CDC website. You can go to the Department of Health website. You could also go to uh, the, uh, it's called the White House uh, COVID-19 response uh, website. They also have resources there. And you can use the toolkit if there's no other one. This one is also very specific. That's, for that's what I was going to say. You know, all of this information that she's sharing, she put in this toolkit. It's in English. It's in Spanish. Um, it's very easily accessible. I know we have it in on the Chamber website in our COVID-19, um, you know, portal. Um, so it's on there. So I will also include the link down in the comments a little bit after. So if you guys want to circle back. Um, but thank you so much. This has been really amazing. Is there anything you want to say before we wrap up? Um, I just want to encourage every single individual that uh, you are special. You are not alone and you can do it. If there are big challenges, the way Melanie highlighted, there are even greater challenges. I know, especially during pandemics, but there are also greater mentors. And I ask you to please reach out to a trusted source, reach out to a community leader or someone that you have trust in that can help and guide you. You're not alone and together we can make uh, Pennsylvania safe and healthy and uh, continue to do what you do. There'll never, there'll never be another you. There isn't another you, but we are here to help you. And whatever we can do in our capacity, we are committed. And uh, may God bless you and may you continue to excel in everything that you do. Thank you so much. We, we have been so blessed to have you today. Um, and I want to thank all of you guys. Um, I know that there are a lot of people who tune in every week and we're so happy to have you. Um, the Latino Pittsburgh Digital Speaker Series is an initiative of the Pittsburgh Metropolitan Area Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Its goals are to share relevant information, inspire growth and foster opportunity. Speakers include community members, and other individuals who have a positive impact, not only on the Hispanic community, but the Pittsburgh region at large. Um, this is something that we do every week. Usually it's on Tuesdays at 12. Every once in a while, we'll switch it to Wednesdays, but you can always check out our Facebook. Next week, we're actually taking a week off. Um, and that is because we want everyone to go out and vote. Um, I think, you know, we have been bombarded with the importance of the vote. We've seen all the posts everywhere but there's a big difference between having the intention and actually doing it. Um, as you know, this is a very pivotal time for our country. And I would ask that you not only voice your opinion on social media, but you actually take the time if you haven't voted already to go in person. Yes, the lines will be long. Take a sandwich, take a drink. I know I will, I'll probably take a book as well. Um, but I'm going to be there as long as it takes, and I hope that you are too. Um, the speaker series will be returning on, I believe it's November 10th, and we're going to have George Fernandez. He is the founder and CEO of the Latino Connection, which is an amazing organization that I really can't wait for you to hear more about. So if you guys want to become a speaker, you can feel free to email me at chamber at pm ahcc.org and you can learn more at our website right there well i hope to see you guys next week thanks for tuning in and stay positive and test negative thank you